Hi, uh, good evening or good afternoon and welcome to uh, our um, uh, uh, webinar uh, on nutrition and how uh, across the lifespan Uh-oh, are you there, Trey? Yeah, I'm still here. Okay. Uh, I'm getting a little feedback, but um, my name is Trey Wareham. Uh, we are here uh, today to talk about nutrition. Uh, I, am I here? Are we, are we available? Yep. We're okay. Here. Okay. So my name is Trey Wareham. Uh, we're here today to talk about nutrition and the various aspects of it. Uh, growing up, I was always told, eat everything. Uh, the more you eat, the better. Uh, the high calorie foods and high fatty foods are everything that you need to do. Um, we will learn today about the research uh, and uh, with modulators such as Trifacta. Um, we are uh, living longer and um, how we face the different challenges along the way. Um, the people with CF are now faced with living longer and excelling every day. We're looking for things uh, for CF uh, to uh, make the future bright. We will learn through about the CF through the eyes of Shelby, who is a young lady with CF, uh, Danielle, who is an aunt with a nephew with CF, as well as two nutritionists who will tell us about their story and the great information about what each of them have gone through and accomplished, as well as nutritional needs. Some housekeeping tips uh, we need to make aware of. Uh, the panel is being recorded. The session chart is under the stage tab and people could submit some questions in regards to the chat box. Although people here today have, have or been uh, caregivers to CF, information shared should not serve as a substitute um, for medical advice. Medical health counselors are available and on call on the and the health box is located in the expo booth of the booth of the, of the uh, um, is also available. Um, the next slide will take to Shelby and have her um, talk about her experiences. Thank you so much, Trey. Hi, everyone. Before I jump into my portion of the session, I just want to give some attention to go over how sensitive we know that this talk could become. We know how personal the conversation of nutrition can be. It can be emotional and it can be a lot to talk about. And we've tried our best to be aware of that as we created this focus today. We understand that everyone has a different perspective and relationship regarding their experience and outlook and the needs of us change over time along with nutrition management. And that's okay. Each of our journeys will have different things that we all go through. If the conversation becomes too much, there are the mental health counselors on call during the event. They're here if you need it you can go to the expo booth area and hit the help desk. And with all of that said, let's dive in. Many of you know me, but for those who do not, I am Shelby Lubert. I am 31 and I have CF. I was diagnosed at a year old and have two of the more rare mutations of CF and I live in St. Louis, Missouri. Growing up, I was relatively healthy. I was pancreatic insufficient, but I learned to take my enzymes at a young age. I didn't have much issue when it came to my CF until my teens when GI issues became more frequent. Growing up in the 90s, the conversation around food was always like what Trey said. 
what's bad for normal people is absolutely fine for me. It doesn't matter what calories you get in as long as you're getting them in. I often had DS, which stands for distal intestinal obstruction syndrome, and would spend days trying to clear my system out when I would get blocked up. This would cause me to miss school often, and I also had a lot of issues with liver stones in my biliary ducts. I had minor lung issues, but tried to combat that with sports and other way airway clearance techniques. My bigger issues hit when I hit my early 20s. I was having frequent lung exacerbations, which meant frequent antibiotic use, hurting my gut in the end, and I was working full-time as a pharmacy tech and long hours, and my body was working harder to stay stable. Soon, autoimmune issues came into play full force. It was like a light switch flipped in my body. I was having frequent vomiting, exhaustion, weird rashes, fevers that weren't connected to my CF, but were aggravating my CF, and it felt like I couldn't keep nutrition in. I tried to power through working, but truthfully almost worked my way into the ground. By the age of 24, I was forced to get a G-tube, and this was supposed to be the magical fix to keep nutrition down and give my body a rest. That magical fix sadly did not happen. Feeds would not stay down. I was vomiting everything up. My doctors were at a loss. And at 5'6", I was skeletal and I was 82 pounds. I then formed a really unhealthy relationship to food and food aversions, knowing that it was probably just going to come right back up. It was then that I knew that my life was truly in danger. If I can't keep anything down, my body will not thrive. And I wasn't going to make it through this. I'm going to take a pause right here in my story to bring on one of the dietitians that we have this afternoon, because this is also in my life where we really shifted focus to bring in a dietitian I had at the time as well. I want to welcome Katie McDonald, who is a registered pediatric dietitian and nutritionist at Primary Children's CF Center in Salt Lake City, Utah. She has been with Primary for 44 years, with the last 32 years specializing in nutrition care of infants and children with CF. She also has experience in enteral tube feeding, quality improvement, and food insecurity. Welcome, Katie. Hi, thank you so much, Shelby. And I am so pleased to be here at the Family Con and to talk with things I am so passionate about, um, cystic fibrosis and nutrition. The early model for management of cystic fibrosis really was based on three pillars, pulmonary health, infection control, and nutrition. Um, as, as this progressed, this um, was really interesting to follow and these three pillars contributed to survival and survival was the goal uh, for everything that happened with the management of cystic fibrosis fibrosis. Next, please. In the 1990s, the body mass index through research became the predominant marker of nutrition status. Higher BMI was associated with, um, with better survival. But with the introduction of, of CFTR modulators and advanced different kinds of treatments, many people with cystic fibrosis and their care teams have shifted from survival mode to thrive mode. And as we progress through 2002, nutrition does remain a basic pillar of CF care, but with a more inclusive and more individualized intent. BMI, important as we said, and a marker, but we're also looking at things like exercise, food security. We're looking at social determinants of health. Are you adequately housed? Do you have a job? Do you have good education? What about micronutrient status? The vitamins and minerals that are so important to all of us. Heart health is another function that was so important. Muscle mass is an incredible indicator of health for people with cystic fibrosis. GI health, things that Shelby alluded to, um, so important and we want to help manage bone health for people with cystic fibrosis. 
metabolic health. Is your blood sugar under control? What can we do to help manage that? Psychological health, relationships with eating and food. Very important to help with nutritional status. And we can't forget, food is important, nutrition is important as part of the fabric of our daily life. It's part of our social enjoyment and just one of the wonderful things about being alive. We want to enjoy our food. Uh, we have basic nutrition guidelines that apply to the entire um, population, such as my plate. And now we're of the opinion that those basic recommendations should really be important for people with cystic fibrosis as well. And then there's personal preference. What you like, what somebody else likes, not always the same. It needs to be addressed and individualized. And individualization is really a key going forward. So by this year, 2022, BMI is just one of many components of nutritional health. It's important. It's something that should be monitored but certainly not the single focus of our nutrition uh, therapy. So CF clinic dietitians can assist people with CF with many things, individualizing nutrition therapy, um, working on healthy habits, um, things as simple as having meals together as a family. What about navigating those changes in nutritional requirements that have happened? Uh, for people through the lifespan and with different medications. Weight management can be important. Cardiovascular health, as people with cystic fibrosis are living longer, this is something that really needs to be addressed. Sports nutrition, with the pediatric group that I work with, I love talking about sports nutrition with our athlete, our active athletic teens. It's great. Um, what about vitamin nutritional needs? Certainly those are changing. Um, and specialized nutrition therapy. Unfortunately, because a person has CF, it doesn't mean that you can't have something else, uh, something that Shelby was alluding to in her discussion earlier. Um, advancing nutrition therapy requires mutual trust between the care team and the individual and open collaboration. In advocating for system-wide changes for nutrition care for cystic fibrosis, it's important to recognize that the cystic fibrosis and individual CF care centers are strongly committed to continuously improving the quality of all aspects of patient CF care, including for nutrition. Speak up and constructively advocate for the changes you want to see in your nutrition care that's provided. Um, respond to the experience of care or XOC survey when you receive them. That's a, a very powerful way to have your message um, get out to the team. If you have an opportunity to provide pre-visit planning con concerns to clinic, please do so. Let us know, you know if you're interested in um, vegetarian diet or if you have concerns about um, maybe too rapid weight gain, unintentional weight loss, anything like that, uh, letting us know about it beforehand um, so that we can prepare information for you will help uh, speed the process. Participate in your CF Center quality improvement initiatives. Uh, check in with your local CF Center. Um, they've got something going on most likely. And we're always looking for people who want to help. The voice of the patient, the, the parent of the child with CF is so important as we make improvements. Get involved with your local CF parent or patient advisory council to collaborate um, on a little bit larger scale with your CF center. Patience and persistence will pay off. We're looking at a lot of changes as well. Um, we know that the care that we provide needs to stay up with the times and we want to we want to be there and meet the needs of the families with CF. And I believe 
um, that Danielle is going to follow me now. Oh, no, not yet. Uh, excuse me. My favorite slide. Please go on. Because there's one more thing. I've thought about CF for a long time. I've been working with CF for 32 years. And I go back to this um, picture in my mind of these plate spinners. If you've never seen them, they're, you know, a, an act, a variety show act. Um, and the object is to spin a plate on a stick. And you keep spinning plates and spinning more and spinning and spinning until, of course, they all come crashing down. But I always think about people with CF as being those plate spinners. Um, and we want to keep as many plates in the air spinning. And um, next, people with CF are expected to balance so many things at once. Your healthcare providers want to assist, but sometimes it's maybe too much. We keep handing you plates and smiling and handing you another plate and telling you to spin it. So my thought is maybe choose one goal to master or perhaps try it and say, nope, not for me, before you choose another one. Keep those plates spinning, but do it at your own pace. And it's okay to start with something easy. My colleague Shannon is going to talk a little bit more about some very specific steps that maybe people want to consider. And now it's time for me to introduce Danielle. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Hi, thank you, Katie. That was so great. Um, I am Danielle Driggers. I am a CF aunt uh, to the sweetest little nine-year-old um, guy you'll ever meet. His name is Aspen. And I've been walking this journey with him with cystic fibrosis since the beginning. Um, I was there with his diagnosis and have um, just grown immensely passionate about this cure. Um, I started working at the foundation in 2019. My husband works in CF research. Um, and so truly we've made it a family affair and nutrition in CF is just, um, it's become something that I've gotten really passionate about. And again, I'm not a medical expert, but I've got a lot of opinions on um, nutrition as it, to, as it pertains to CF. So um, I'm happy to be a part of this, um, this panel today. Um, just to tell you a little bit about our journey with CF, Aspen was diagnosed in 2013, and I'll never forget them looking at us and saying, CF is not something you want to be born with, but there's so much hope. There's this miracle drug that's going to be there in five or 10 years, and um, we just know it's going to help. And there was just so much hope presented to us in that moment. Um, well, turns out eight years later, um, the drug was approved and now he's on it and, um, and he's doing great. From birth, Aspen has had mostly GI nutritional issues. Um, and so that's partly why I've become passionate about the, uh, the topic of nutrition, because that's somewhere that he hasn't necessarily thrived. And for him, um, he's always struggled with not being able to gain weight. And as you heard um, Katie say earlier, your BMI directly affects your lung function um, and directly affects your overall health. So um, for Aspen, not being able to be able to gain weight has affected his whole body um, in a negative way. And so as I told you, we were presented with so much hope with Trikafta coming down the line for him. And we just kept waiting. Well, we're, we won't look at a feeding tube until he's got, gotten on Trikafta. We won't try this or that until he's gotten on Trikafta, until we um, give this like one more shot. This drug is going to be um, what does it for him. So in 2021, he started uh, taking Trikafta after it was approved by the FDA for six to six years old and up. Um, and he was fine but it wasn't our miracle drug. I mean, it definitely, I think helps him. He has been overall pretty healthy, but he hasn't gained any weight. Um, and so that's been another discussion that we've had to revisit. He just keeps growing taller and his BMI just keeps going down. Um, and it's something that we've learned that we have to um, be cautious with and we know it is going to affect his overall long-term health. So um, one thing that I really appreciate this about this panel and the dietitians that are on this call is the the emphasis that they put on 
partnering with your care team to figure out what's going on, being open and honest, um, looking at all the options, not looking at feeding tube as your only option or appetite stimulant as your only option, trying a bunch of different things and working with your team um, has been so helpful um, for our family in particular. Um, one thing that is most notable to me in our journey is really how the, the conversation um, about nutrition and CF has evolved over time. Um, when Aspen was first born, it was very much a, any calories are good calorie, eat as much as you can, just let them gain weight. Um, and now it's very much like, be careful what you put in your body. Possibly uh, CF related diabetes is uh, an issue with in causing maybe his lack of weight gain. Um, and that obviously is directly impacted by your nutrition. So it's such a cumbersome, um, deep, multifaceted conversation that um, really I, I appreciate people like the dietitians that are on the call who are ready and willing and able to advocate for you and figure out what's going on to make your life better. Um, so I get the pleasure of introducing our next dietitian. Her name is Shannon, and she's been a dietitian for the Adult CF Center in Innova Fairfax for almost two years. Um, she is a graduate of the University of Connecticut and has enjoyed working in various dietitian roles over the past 20 years. Uh, Shannon loves helping people living with CF meet their individual nutrition goals. That's my favorite part, the individual piece. Um, and of course, is hoping to help uh, others live their best life. So Shannon, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Danielle. Um, as you've heard already today, nutrition can be a really personal topic and everyone has different needs and different goals. Um, many people living with CF today are experiencing body changes and even weight gain with these highly effective modulator therapies. I think Trey brought up a great point when he shared that growing up, he was encouraged to eat as much as possible all the time in order to take in all the calories he needed. This is very common for CF patients who previously struggled with malnutrition and weight gain. The issue now is that it's very hard to recognize these body signals and hunger cues when you've been trained to ignore or push past them for so long. So something I talk a lot in clinic about is this concept of the hunger scale. Uh, you can see on the screen that it ranges from a one to 10 with one being an, a state of like absolute starvation. Like you would reach for the first thing in your pantry and eat whatever was easiest to get your hands on um, at that time. The other extreme of the scale is total fullness. Like you can't fit in one more bite. The idea is to try to kind of stay in the, in the middle of this scale, try to live between a four and a seven. Um, maybe you're starting to feel hungry, your stomach is rumbling, you're starting to maybe lose some focus. Um, so you have a sensible meal or a snack and you feel comfortably full at a seven. When you allow yourself to drift towards those extremes of the scale, that's where poor choices are made. <laughs> um, along with the hunger scale, I think it's really important, uh, next slide please, to promote a healthy attitude towards food. As people with CF experience changes with their bodies, it's also important to promote a healthy mindset um, as well as balanced nutrition. So these are some um, kind of principles that I like to live by. They're called the 10 principles of intuitive eating. Um, this is an eating style that can be followed by everyone, not just people with CF. Um, so the 10 principles are um, rejecting the diet, right? Stop thinking you have to be super restrictive to lose weight. This feels like feeling, this leads to feeling like a failure when it doesn't work for you. Honor your hunger. If you're hungry, you should eat. Doing so prevents overeating later on. Make peace with your food. Stop labeling foods as good or bad. This can lead to binging and guilt. Challenge the food police. Nobody likes the food police. Nobody wants to be judged or shamed for their very personal food choices when it's an internal voice or somebody else. Um, discover satisfaction in your food. Really take the time to enjoy your food. Appreciate the color and the texture and the flavor and really make your meals an event. Um, feel your fullness. This goes back to that hunger scale that I touched on. Try to listen to your body signals. Cope with kindness. Recognize emotional eating and recognize your triggers. Give yourself grace. No one eats perfectly every single day, not even the dietitians. <laughs> um, respect your body. 
everyone has different genetics that determine their body size and shape. And that's going to be very difficult to change or impossible, really. Um, movement, feel the difference. Stop making exercise a chore. Find a way to move your body that isn't about burning calories. Learn to move your body to feel the energy. Maybe it's a dance party with your kids in the kitchen. Maybe it's an evening walk with your neighbor to catch up. Maybe you like to listen to an audio book. Um, just, just move to feel better. And lastly, honor your health. Make food choices that are nutrient dense and make you feel good. Every day does not have to be perfect. It's the consistency over time that brings about progress. So you might be thinking, Shannon, this is all great. Love these concepts, but what should a person with CF actually eat? Um, next slide, please. Because nutrition is so personal, it's hard to make a blanket statement that works for everyone. As the life expectancy for CF continues to lengthen, we're shifting towards eating habits and recommendations that are more in line with general healthy guidelines and take into account preventing other illnesses like heart disease or cancer. This means lots of fruits and vegetables, unsaturated fats like olive oil, um, plant-based sources like avocado or nut butters, lean proteins, and whole grains. So the MyPlate graphic shown here is the template for how a balanced meal should look to ensure meeting the recommended intakes for all those vitamins, minerals, carbohydrates, fats, and protein. You can see that fruits and vegetables take up half the plate. Um, these provide you with, with the different vitamins and minerals, as well as fiber. Grains are about a quarter of the plate, and then your best choices would come from whole grains, like whole wheat breads or pasta, quinoa, maybe oatmeal. Protein is another quarter of the plate. And this is where you would portion your meat or your eggs. Maybe you're following a vegan or vegetarian plan, and that might include tofu, nuts and seeds, or nut butters. Lastly, the dairy circle is representing good calcium sources. So this might be cow's milk, cheese, yogurt, might be soy milk if you're following something more plant forward. So as you can see, there's many possibilities for tailoring the right nutrition plan for a person with CF. It's so important to use your dietitian to make the right plan for you or your family member with CF. So I think we're gonna bring back Shelby and have her <laughs> speak. Thank you so much, Shannon and Danielle as well for sharing your story with Sweet Aspen and helping advocate. It truly takes a village. And Shannon, I really wish that I would have had these graphics and this info back when I was going through so much. We were just trying to force feeds. We were trying to get things to stay down. I wasn't even hungry. And it came to the point of being at a crossroads with my team and the dietitian. I had a terrible relationship with food and I felt like I was just losing steam. This is also about the time that my CF center started changing their CF standards um, from any calorie that you can get in to really looking at things with a different scope. So what changed? I had to advocate. I food journaled. I dug deep because I knew that something was wrong that wasn't necessarily CF related. All I knew was that things had to change. Even when they thought that it was me making myself sick or it was just in my head, I wanted to prove and show the evidence for what I felt was truly going on. Otherwise, I knew that I wasn't going to make it. I just needed somebody to actually listen. So I ended up changing care centers to the opposite side of Missouri, and I got a second opinion. What's a second opinion going to hurt? And they were interested. I was able to start over, essentially. I worked with a new dietitian, and we looked at what would stay down, and we went from there. We built trust, and that's something that I'm forever grateful for. This slide right here on advocacy is a lot to look at, but I know that it's something that I really wanted to share. I also know that this is not going to work for everyone, but it's an option. It was the transparency that helped. I was able to log what I ate, even if it was later in the evening and just looking back to give a good look at things. And then every Sunday, I would send a PDF version that was in my app to my dietitian. I was transparent and if I only ate a snack that day and that was it, or I only drank some soda and had some chips. I also symptom tracked along with that as things came up in another app. We would go over things that week and we would see what we needed to work on, what goals needed to be made, how we can kind of use the my plate as a feature of really trying to build back nutrition in my life. 
We found that gluten and dairy were wrecking havoc on my system the most, and we cut them. We found other sources that could take the place of that that would be easier on my body. I went on 24-7 tube feeds for about six to eight months to help reset my inflamed system. We found a supplement drink that was completely vegan, not just lactose-free, and it helped tremendously. It stayed down. I also got diagnosed with celiac disease after getting an endoscopy and colonoscopy done to rule everything else out, and that changed things even more. I think this is a good way to bring back the dietitians again as they sort of go over their roles within things as well within your care team. Thank you, Shelby. Um, that was great to hear of, about your success with, um, you know, with your food journaling. I think that that's a, a really helpful approach. Um, I think one of the things that, that people do when they keep food journals is not write everything down or really censor, um, you know, what they might be including in there. And, and that's not necessary. That's not helpful. Um, the dietitians really want to help you, you know, individually find um, what's working for you. Um, and and by, by looking at a food journal, we can really see you know, where you might have gaps or, or where, you know, your, your patterns might be off or um, maybe you're struggling with your blood sugars. And, and so um, food journaling can be, can be really helpful um, in that situation. I will say it, it is oftentimes tedious for people too. So like, like everything else with nutrition, it might not be the right answer. Um, I think that there's also a difference between maybe food journaling, as you've described, and kind of food tracking. Um, where people get really caught up in counting calories and macronutrients. And um, that can be a little bit dangerous. It can be, you know, lead to some disordered eating. So um, really work with your care team to find, um, you know, a, a plan that, that works for you. And, and if you need to include maybe the social workers or the mental health coordinators too, then um, those are all really great resources. And I, I would like to add to what you say, and I completely agree with you, Shannon, on that, that as I have um, looked at food journals, you know, that's one thing, but very often people will just pay attention to what they're eating, write down some general things, and um, it, it has been so interesting that people would say, you know, I never thought about this before, but once I wrote it down, I realized, and they they come to me with a solution. So the food journaling can be very helpful, but again, I want to really um, state again what Shannon said, sometimes it's too much. Yeah. There's really got to be a happy medium. <laughs> Too many plates there. <laughs> Too many plates. Exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, you know, that's kind of the, one of the points that's, that's shown on this slide. I, I don't think I need to read them all through, but, um, you know, dietitians really want to empower you to make your own food choices. Um, everybody has, has likes and dislikes and things are going to be really individual. For you, we don't really like to do meal plans. That might surprise some people. Um, dietitians don't don't like meal plans too much. They're too canned. They're too, uh, you know, kind of standardized. So so we'd like to work with you and find um, something that's better. <laughs> and I would like to say that dietitians are trained in a variety of health and nutrition related topics. And um, if nothing else, even if we are not experts in a certain field, for example, Shelby, you mentioned celiac disease. Now, I know celiac disease a little bit, but I know somebody who teaches a master class in celiac disease and gluten-free management. I would definitely refer someone to those other resources. So uh, we can help guide people along the way. And um, we're not mind readers. Uh, if if there are questions that people have, information that they want to have, um, we can help you find it. Uh, so please think of your dietitian as a resource guide. Um, I wish I knew everything, but the older <laughs> I get, the more I realize I don't know. So, but I, I know where to find things. Absolutely. Please utilize those services. <laughs> 
And the, the I don't know if people realize, but the CF network has um, a, a really, really wonderful resources and, and a huge network of other dietitians that we can reach out to um, that Absolutely. might have expertise in another area. So, uh -huh. And very know. often we do that. You know, if somebody comes to us with an issue and we say, I don't know what to do, then our uh, CF network of dietitians is one of the first resources we go to and say, hey, I need help with this. Somebody help me. And so we we do have a lot of resources we can draw on. Absolutely. And I love that from a patient standpoint, too, that it's not just our dietitian that we work with or necessarily think it's like the end all because all of our needs are so different. Mm -hmm. No, I think I think that's one of the things that I really like as a dietitian uh, with CF is the network, very strong network of um, other dietitians who are eager to help and to provide some feedback. Because, you know, as we've said many times, people are very individual and no two cases are exactly alike. Um, so it's, it's good to have a little depth. So we're a team. Absolutely. I've always loved the phrase that it takes a village because in the CF community, I feel like it really does. Um, and I think kind of as we go into this next slide here, we know our bodies the best. We know what may work for us or if something feels off, what may need to be looked at deeper. I see in the comments even, um, there's another CF parent who has a child with celiac and I didn't realize how prevalent it could really be. Um, and I have recently heard that research back before there was a lot of CF info, they thought that CF and celiac were one and the same almost. That's so it's correct. interesting how things have changed throughout the years. Yeah. And I'm so grateful for conferences like this to help, you know, talk about all of this. And it helps find our voice within ourselves and what we're passionate about. And I know that we all, in a way, somehow throughout our lives, will kind of walk a tightrope when it comes to what we eat, and what we can and can't control, and it can slip into bad habits or eating disorders or anything of the like. And I know that now that we have this part figured out, like I'm still fighting CF issues every day from the roller coaster of the past decade, essentially. And right now I'm pre-transplant and I know that having my diet at least figured out now that if and when that time comes, we have everything at least squared away. We have a game plan for what will stay down for me and what nutrition will work, essentially. And I know, Trey, that you have a lot of experience with this. And do you want to give us some tidbits and potential tips through your experience through organ transplantation? And I know a lot of things played into your journey as well. Yeah, actually, um, I was um, put on the list and actually went uh, down to Duke uh, University um, because of some uh, virus that um, maintained or came up in my blood um, wow. because of uh, some of the things that happened on the transplant side. Uh, my uh, hospital, which is Columbia, decided not to do the, the transplant because they were worried about I guess me surviving. Um, so having said that, um, I went down to Duke. I lived uh, there for a month and went to uh, physical therapy. Um, most of the time was just spent going back and forth to the therapy office and back home to the apartment. Um, then uh, after graduating, which was again about a month, um, a lot of it was, uh, you know, and there were some tests that were done because believe it or not, there were some aspects that you actually, actually, actually have to be probably the most healthiest person in the world be, uh, before you're transplanted. Um, because of the different tests, uh, they were able to verify that number one, you know, what. Uh, from my lungs to my heart to my bones, um, I kind of 
uh, dealt with a lot of the uh, outside of CF, everything else was uh, on the table. Um, and then luckily, towards the end of, uh, end of the month, um, once I graduated, I was put on the list. And uh, after a false alarm, uh, where I was called in and the lungs weren't uh, viable, um, I was sent home. And then about two days later, I was called and luckily I got my lungs. And six years ago, or it's actually six and a half years ago, um, I was transplanted. So uh, that's my story. Um, uh, you know, otherwise, everything's been going well. Um, initially, I had some issues. Um, but of, overall, uh, everything's been kind of on the up and up and um, ready to take on the, the next challenge. That's amazing. I'm just so happy everything yeah. has gone well. And it's so hard when it comes to having a transplant, whether if you think it's going to go well or not, things can change in an instant. Yeah, believe it or not, uh, you know, it was one of those things where I was always healthy growing up. Um, you know, I was kind of of the mindset that, well, that doesn't affect me and I've learned to deal with it. So I just powered through to it. Um, I played varsity lacrosse uh, all through college. Um, and it wasn't until after college that I, I got sick, probably because I blew out my knee um, <laughs> playing lacrosse. Um, but overall, because of the activity that I had done, um, it kind of, uh, I guess it worked out that until I became less active and um, more lazy, you know, in a sense that um, I got sick. And uh, believe it or not, you know, some of the modulators um, actually almost, you know, um, made me, uh, I guess, brought on other issues in that I did not do well on the, uh, the trifecta. Um, and hence, I got put on the list and um, you know, I guess it hastened my uh, transplant uh, process. So um, having, uh, oh, okay. So moving forward, um, I see an issue or a question about uh, anyone else's child with CF refused to eat. Uh, we are in that stage right now and it has been extremely difficult. Um, we can't decide if it's CF related or if he, if he was just a, uh, a picky eater. Um, mm -hmm. Any comments or any tips? Um, maybe, you know, we could start with some of the uh, dietitians to see if they could provide some input on that. Um, I would be happy to take that question, Trey, because um, as a pediatric uh, CF dietitian, that's one that comes up very, very often. Um, some of the things that we look at um, would be behavioral strategies around eating and to try to uh, pay more attention to the child when they are actually eating than when they're not eating. Now, as a parent and a grandparent, I know it's a lot more natural to say, would you pick up your spoon and start eating, <laughs> you know, rather than say, wow, that's a great job you're doing, Trey. Look at you. You're taking one bite right after another. Way to go. Did I just see you eat some green beans? Way to go. Um, so that's, you know, that's one point. The other thing that um, we are very fortunate in our clinic to have a speech language pathologist who specializes in feeding therapy. Children with CF um, are more likely to have oral aversions. Um, this can be due to giving um, the enzymes, you know, which of course are necessary, they need them. But um, our feeding therapist has said, 
well, how would you feel if you had to take a spoonful of gravel every time you had something to eat? Yeah, right. You know, and, and that's it's not pleasant. So um, the feeding therapy has been very, very important for us, um, you know, and to look at that. The other thing that um, that we, you know, as a dietitian, we look at increasing calories um, for the healthy nutrients that they do receive, not just feed them all the can uh, Coke and donuts that they can stand. Um, but, you know, that's one thing on our end. The other thing goes back to what we were saying in regard to Shelby's story. Sometimes it's not just CF. And so we do a lot of referrals to gastroenterology to look for other things. Um, is there um, something you know, an inflammation of the esophagus. Um, do they have celiac disease? What is it that's going on? And so um, it's important, again, to work with the uh, CF team to, you know, to really sort through this. Um, it's a, And it's hard to know. Uh, I think, you know, even as a parent or grandparent um, for children who don't have CF, if they refuse to eat, boy, that, you know, my hackles go up. And I know that, that you know, it's, what do you mean you're not going to eat? Um, and it's hard, you know, on um, on a lot of levels to deal with that. Um, but there is help out there. Um, it seems like, again, the, being on the more positive side, that you can kind of just for or not force um no, not just force. A, a, a play apply to that therapy um to the basic eating and right. encourage the individual um as as they're doing that yeah um, you know one thing I, that was always told to us um that I think really helped uh, my nephew was having ownership over his meal decisions absolutely um, and so having him tell you what he wants for dinner, giving him options on things to pick from, um, you can choose this, this, and this, whatever you want. And um, after he had ownership over his meals and realized he could literally eat a basket of fruit and that would be it. We're like, mm -hmm. well, yay, you want fruit, not candy, but you also need more. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, And there's, you know, and I think that that's an important, a very important point that you bring up, it's the parent's responsibility to provide healthy, nutritious options within reason. Um, and I do not ever expect a family to run a short order restaurant. You know, right. we, we don't want families to say, whatever you want, I'll fix it. Whatever it is, you know, nothing is too much. You didn't like those pancakes I made special for you? Okay, well, let's start with something else then. You know, I think that it's very realistic to give a couple of options. You can eat your pork chop um, with the mashed potatoes that I fixed, or there's a carton of yogurt. But, and you know, we not did, just say, we would, over. Yeah, please. We would, um, our family goes grocery shopping. Me, my sister, and my mom go grocery shopping every week on Sunday. Wow. <laughs> I know, funny and maybe <laughs> weird, but um, we, my sister would have that conversation with Aspen and say, we're going grocery shopping. Tell me what you want for the week so that it doesn't come down to, well, I've made this meal and now you want other options. It's you've that's, been that's part of the good planning way. process. Um, mm -hmm. And so you have an expectation of what you're going to be eating for dinner <laughs> and you've had your input heard. Um, and so then he has just been more willing and able to um yeah. What has been given to him. Um, I think that worked out well. Yeah, it, it, it really has worked out well. Right. That's so good to hear. I love that that's also kind of teaching autonomy, like as he gets older as well. And he might be interested in helping cook those meals or helping, Absolutely. you know, have a good relationship around it. I know with me, it became to the point of, just trying to get in whatever would stay down. And it became such an unhealthy relationship with food because I ended up having to think about, okay, if I throw this up, how awful is it going to be? So then yeah. like, I just stuck with things that were actually aggravating my system even more. Yeah. Um, and I, I, 
I would like to add one thing um, about it, and it goes back to what you're saying, Shelby, is that um, many families see um, gastric uh, tubes, you know, a G-tube, a gastrostomy, as the worst thing in the mm -hmm. world. And it, it really, we, we try to present it as an option that if you can't, you know, if you can't see well, you wear glasses. If you can't hear well, mm -hmm. you need hearing aids. And if you can't eat enough and it's impacting your health, then this is just a tool. So I think uh, that's a good thing to touch on too, that, and even if you do end up getting a G2, we went through eight different supplements, blended feeds, anything yeah. that we could get to stay down. So if right. something's not working for you, it's okay to there try more. something else. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be looked at as a permanent. It's a tool in your tool belt. Mm -hmm. It's not a permanent fix. Yeah. Um, it's to get you to the next stage. And exactly. I think sometimes it helps mitigate some of those stressors that you're having. Absolutely. Stress, right? Right. You're, you're talking about picky eating. You're talking about, you know, not, you know, you know, asking them to do things that, that, that they don't want to do. Um, so I, I think that if you look at it in a way that, you know, this can reduce some of the, some of that conflict. Um, Absolutely. And it's not a temporary, you know, it's not a permanent thing. It can be temporary and it can help kind of heal your re relationship um, about some of those things too, I think mm -hmm. is an important factor to consider. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, another question has come up. Uh, what are the signs that indicate that you should reduce gluten in your diet? So I can take that one. Um, I was going to say it's a <laughs> loaded uh, question. Yeah, I, I don't think that there is, a, you know, a particular sign. I think, again, it's going to be different for everyone. Um, for somebody, it might be bloating. For somebody, it might be, you know, loose stool. For somebody, it might be the opposite. Um, and that's, I think, maybe where food journaling could be helpful. Um, you know, if you, if you kind of keep track of what you're eating and when you're experiencing some of these symptoms, then we can kind of tease out some of those things, um, you know, you can do kind of an elimination diet where, where you, you, you do focus on, on choosing gluten-free um, choices for, for a little while and see if it helps. And if it doesn't help, then, then you know, you don't need to do that. Um, there's no reason to restrict foods that don't need to be restricted, right? <laughs> uh, I know with me, once we started to food journal and symptom journal kind of in tandem, we could see the cause and effect of things. With me, my chest was actually getting tight. Um, with gluten and dairy. And I see there's a comment um, on the chat as well about dairy. And this worked for me. It's not going to work for everybody. But as soon as I cut gluten and dairy, my Dias issues went away. I was no longer completely constipated and backed up. We called that my system would essentially take naps. Like it would just shut down and it would stop moving things. And I think just compacting and compounding that issue was making things worse. So that was the way that we could really tell I mean, my food just doesn't, wasn't digesting well. I was vomiting, the chest tightness, all of that was my biggest indicators in that cause and effect of symptoms to cut it. And I, I would like to add that there are specific clinical tests that can be done. There's blood work. Mm -hmm. And then the gold standard is uh, to do an endoscopy and actually look at the um, architecture of the bowel that they can tell from that. So there are some very specific reasons. Um, now, not everybody who doesn't tolerate gluten has uh, celiac disease, exactly. but um, it's certainly worth investigating uh, to know exactly where you stand on that. And if it's uh, you know, I worry about people eliminating too many things mm -hmm. um, that they don't need to, that, you know, it's hard to get a balanced diet. Certainly it's possible to live very well without wheat and wheat products, but um, we worry about just eliminating, eliminating, eliminating and missing out on nutrients if yeah. you don't need to. We actually found that I have mild gastroparesis as well. So my um, body doesn't like to digest things like hummus. Evidently not. Yeah. And peanut butter. So things very hard to digest. They'll just sit there. And I think yeah. that that's. What a journey that's been for you. It's been crazy. It yeah. has. 
Um, what a but I see it often in the community that people will say, well, I try to eat this and it just doesn't want to go through my body. And I think that's good to get a GI doctor and to see if it is gastroparesis or slow motility or if something really is aggravating the system. Mm -hmm. the, go ahead, Trey. I see, but I oh. see a question in our chat that I, I'm interested in. Oh, uh, Take it away. are there more people uh, likely to develop sensitivities to dairy rather than the average population? Are we likely to see to have food allergies in general? Okay, so I don't you know, there are a lot of intolerances and there's very much a spectrum of intolerances. Not all intolerances are allergies. Um, but they're intolerances nonetheless, you know, and, and just because you have CF doesn't mean that you can't also be lactose sensitive. Um, that can happen, um, you know, for anybody. So, you know, again, it goes back to the idea that because you have CF doesn't mean you can't have something else and you can have, you know, something else, unfortunately, along with CF. Again, I think that looking at the, the journaling, see what you're sensitive to. Some people may be um, sensitive to sorbitol, so artificial sweeteners in chewing gum. And, um, you know, if you have more than two sticks of artificially sweetened chewing gum in a day, you're in cramps. Um, you know, we've, I've seen things like that happen. So I think paying attention to what you're eating absolutely pays off. Um, and, and I don't know that people are any more or less sensitive with CF, but they're not immune to these things. And we need to consider them, all of them. Shannon, what do you think? Yeah, um, I, I wouldn't say that there's, that there's too many of my patients that I'm seeing that have, um, you know, a host of allergies. Um, I, again, it's very, very individual, um, you, you know, and, and, and and kind of teasing out some of those triggers and, and really listening to your body and, and finding um, how you're reacting is, is going to be the key to, to, to figuring that out. Um, that looks like all of the answers, uh, it, um, being that we've been done for an hour, why don't we uh, take another minute and um, see what what else we can come up with, and then otherwise um, we'll shut down and and uh, have a, um, an opportunity to to research other things um, for the rest of the time. I think this was a great panel, guys. It, it gives a good, vast array of everybody's experiences and aging with CF and how the standards have changed over time and how much they still may change. That's right. Oh, Danielle, I think you're muted. There was a noise in my background, so I muted myself. Sorry about that. It's okay. Um, uh, I was just going to say, if there's anything that you take away from this conversation, it is to look at your dietitians and your care team at your centers um, as advocates for you. Um, there are people to be on your team to help you. Um, and if you're not getting the answers you want or need, like, like Shelby had to do, find someone that will be an advocate for you. And that should be your dietitians on your care team. Um, and using the resources that are at your fingertips, they're always there to help and to um, to work out these kind of situations. So um, if you don't have people in your corner like that, uh, people on this call, feel free to reach out um, and we will get you connected to the right spot, to the right center, to, to whoever um, will be the best for you. I see one more question in the chat really quickly um, to the dietitians. Are things like canola oil bad for you compared to olive oil? They have been told to avoid it. You know, 
excuse me for jumping in, Shannon. I would okay. like to say that we, we want to encourage a wide um, variety of different fats, different essential fatty acids. Um, and the, the fatty acids um, that we're looking at, particularly in uh, corn oil and safflower oil, uh, will provide these things. So if nothing else, I would say diversify your fat portfolio. Absolutely. I concur. <laughs> <laughs> and if you happen to be at NACFC, I'm going to give a talk on essential fatty acids. Oh, I'll look you up. I'll and be there. Check <laughs> that out. <laughs> diversify. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you for everyone um, coming to this webinar. Um, again, uh, there's more research and everything else to be done. Um, and then if there's anything on uh, that you think of, uh, reach out and, you know, either myself or uh, one of the other panelists will uh, be able to answer for you. Um, Thanks a lot, and um, I guess have a good day. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thanks, everyone. I love all the people who I've seen who said, this is my first con, or this is my first family con. I am so happy that you found us. And what are we gonna do to support people with CF, to serve people? with CF better. And so we want to make sure that we can play a role in helping adults with CF connect. CF can be extremely isolating, but it can feel even more so when it feels like there's no one like you in the community. So it's extremely important that we learn how to be a community where no one feels alone when connecting with others with CF. The concept of it taking a village, it doesn't just exist within your immediate family. It's, it's looking outside of, of, of that intimate village we do this, we connect with each other across the country, across the world. It really enriches our communities to have all these voices and all these experiences. I actually had a care center appointment today, and so probably a lot of people here can recognize that those are, are long days full of roller coaster moments. This is my first con for people who don't know that already. And I wanted to share with you guys, I'm in the hospital right now. So I'm dealing with this actively in the moment. But it's also my responsibility to show up as a successful, um, happy adult with CF. Because you get people who their children are diagnosed and they think it's still just a death sentence. From a patient perspective and a family perspective, uh, you're asking me to trust you with my life, and how can I trust someone whom I don't feel a personal connection with? Welcome to Keeping Fit with CF. And exhale, inhale, exhale, inhale. Cultivating an interest in um, learning about CF research and understanding how CF works has really helped me cope so much as a patient. We'll be sharing our stories around mental health and healing. Um, you will hear stories about depression, anxiety. What better way to learn about transplant than hearing from our peers and the people that we love and admire. We hope you had a good time and you learned some new information that you'll take with you um, to your daily life and in your conversations with others. My promise to myself when I was gifted these new lungs was to do all that I could to make a difference in the lives of others. And I had no choice but to ensure that my promise was kept by doing the best that I could to fight, not only for me this time, but for all of you with me.